Now we're going to hear from Andrew talking about life from within that map that, that uh, Amy was sharing. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate the time. Um, thanks, Carla. Uh, yeah, Carla and I did meet at the gym. Uh, she was deadlifting 375, and I was just deadlifting 205, um, which was uh, pretty impressive. Um, and then you should see Morris uh, do even better, Carla's partner. Um, I, yeah, I um, have been in healthcare now 25 plus years, um, and my last eight um, have been involved with Village MD. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more at, um, at the subsequent discussion, but Village MD is a primary care um, company that uh, started out in a really interesting fashion, and the morphing that we had over the past eight years has uh, been kind of following healthcare. So what I thought I'd talk about is the risk-based and the value-based care that we've been chasing, which plays in really nicely with a what Amy was describing, where who pays and who selects what's going on, and then what's the ultimate uh, advantage and um, outcome in this Medicare Advantage, Medicare world that we hear every single day um, in, the, in the headlines. <clears throat> um, by way of background, um, I was a biology major, uh, then uh, went into management consulting with large academic medical centers, uh, then went into revenue cycle, um, then spent some time at Optum, um, because God forbid you're in a uh, medical um, area and you don't work at United Health Group and live in Minneapolis. Uh, it's legally required, I believe. And then found my way to Village MD. And Village MD is, um, was started essentially off the back of a large primary care practice in Houston, Texas. And subsequently, over eight years, we built from those five to 10 um, primary care providers where we now employ over 1,000 providers across the country in 26 markets and uh, control over $2 billion in medical spend. So it's, uh, it's been a, quite a journey, and we'll talk a little, about, a little bit more. But what I'd like to do um, is talk about Medicare <laughs> and value-based care and then really get um, maybe a little bit too detailed, but appropriately so, about how healthcare spend operates and how innovations, technology, diagnosis, et cetera, can influence spend, and then getting back to the, who that customer is at the back end in terms of the primary care physician. So I'm, I'm looking at this lens from the primary care um, perspective. So I, I apologize if this is um, too uh, basic or um, fundamental, but I think it's, it's making sure that we get rooted at the same spot. And essentially the world in medicine right now and med spend is moving from um, volume to value, right? So when you hear about fee-for-service world that we're in on a day-in and day-out basis where Amy was talking about reimbursement by the, um, the healthcare um, companies, by the insurance companies, that's a per click, right? Every single time you see your primary care doc or you see a specialist or whatever, that's a per click. And every time that click happens, there's a reimbursement that goes back. It's not based on outcomes. It's purely based on the cost of that providing care for that aspect. Now, um, and it's just the more and more you go, the higher and higher the reimbursement happens. We're now moving into this value-based world over the past 10 years where it's no longer about the per click, it's a completely about outcomes. And you can see that we're at the tipping point now where the, we're gonna move in the Medicare world um, from over a 50% uh, value versus fee-for-service. Now, when you hear value, it's kind of a fascinating thing. The C, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is trying to push as much of this work into this area. And why I talk about Medicare is because Medicare drives the bus. Um, in 90% of the opportunities here. If you look at your formularies, your reimbursement, everything's at a, it, did Medicare do it first? <laughs> and did, uh, did they approve it? And what is the percentage of merit, Medicare reimbursement that we're gonna have across the board? So that's hence my reason um, for focusing on Medicare. And these are data that I think is pretty well known throughout um, 
the world now, but it's, it's pretty amazing at this point in time, where we're now looking at a per capita total med spend. So that's prescriptions, uh, professional visits, facility charges, et cetera, of almost $13,000 per individual. And that's just taking the entire med spend across the entire country and dividing it by everybody. But to think about that is thinking about each of us is absorbing or utilizing $13,000 of medical spend over the course of a year is just absolutely astonishing. <clears throat> if you look at this group that we have here, and I assume that everybody online um, is as healthy as we are in this, this uh, room, we're not consuming $13,000 worth of medical spend on a yearly basis. Um, there's the stratified aspect of 20% of the individuals are utilizing 80% of the med spend. So if you think about what your personal experience was um, with the healthcare system over the past year or two, you, you probably are thinking more about the chronically ill, the multi-chronic um, conditions of folks. Secondarily, on the lower right-hand side, uh, looking at the total uh, med spend across uh, the United States, we're coming up on 4.2 trillion. Um, year over year, increase of med spend has been 5% plus. So when we're talking about impacting and influencing what goes on in healthcare and total med spend, the amount we're, we're looking at beating the curve and beating the trend, and this is essentially projected to keep going on this uh, rocket ship for many, many years. I remember when I first got into healthcare in the 90s talking about capitation and uh, HMOs and whatnot. They had promised that uh, essentially healthcare costs would decrease against uh, GDP or against inflation. That obviously has failed miserably. Uh, that's not, I believe in that model, um, quite honestly, but it's just where we are at as a society today. Um, so when we're talking about beating um, trend, we're talking about can we do better than, than an increase of 6.5%. And that I, I think that projection was in, by PwC wasn't even adjusted for inflation at that point in time. So success is, uh, uh, is I'm not gonna say easy by any means, but it's uh, gotta be put in context. So looking at the med spend um, by healthcare segment um, in 2022, it's really kind of fascinating how what we're looking at um, in the different aspects where hospital care, facility-based care is at 38% of the healthcare dollar, home health and residential sits at 9.2%, go on and on. Prescription drugs and DME is only 15.6%. But the one that I focus on, which is just absolutely fantastic or fascinating to me, is that primary care and specialists, um, while they're the ones that ultimately control where the care will be delivered. And if you look at primary care, it was only $0.3 trillion on a net basis on a $4.1 trillion number. So you're looking at somebody who's controlling 7% of the med spend in terms of reimbursement, but the other 93% of where money is going to be spent or where people are going to receive services is controlled by that primary care provider. And it's in these value-based care relationships. So ultimately, if I were thinking about, as Carla said, what's the customer of my customer? <laughs> in this case, in this value-based world, what's going to make life easier for my primary care doc? and what's going to drive value in this new world for my primary care doc because they're gonna be held to account um, for what goes on. So this is a, a primer, I guess, um, uh, on what exactly, how does value-based care look. So I'm on the far left side, I'm talking about the individual med spend that we're talking about a per capita, and these are round numbers they're not um, in terms of uh, specificity that's there, so please don't um, do your uh, ROI or your uh, um, anything that, that's on here. I just represented examples, but essentially we assume that an individual spends about 13K a year on um, medical spend, right? So all those categories that we were talking about before, hospitals, specialists, et cetera. Then on a year over year, over year basis, and so in 2022, they spent 13 grand, year over year in increase, 
of 6.5% on the lower left-hand corner. Then we're gonna look at the expected med spend for an individual, right, is gonna be sitting at about 13.7K. So extrapolate this over a, a large population and you start to get the, the economies of scale, but to get it to an individual level at the individual. So our target um, is to, can we beat that 13.7K on a, on a yearly basis? And there's some pretty simple things that we all hear about and you see the billboards in town about go see your urgent care as opposed to um, going directly to the ER. Go see your primary care doc as opposed to seeing, going to the ER. The most classic one that um, I always would talk to my providers about is that, and this is a, a, a really fantastic example, um, just how uh, misaligned incentives can be. Um, several years ago when we were launching this, we were talking to a hospital um, uh, P&L owner. And uh, it was a multi-system, multi-hospital system, and we sat down with the, the leader of the P&L of the, and said, did you know that on Friday nights at eight o'clock, there are on average 20 people that are coming into your health system in your hospital ER that are asthmatics and need assistance. Um, but of those 20 folks, 10 to 15 could, uh, if they properly use their rescue inhaler, they wouldn't have to uh, come to the ER. And uh, the p &L lead said, okay, that's interesting. And all those people are going from either ER visits or even coming in and in, going from ER to inpatient. And uh, the p &L lead looked at us and said, that's really interesting. Um, my bonus is based on the number of admits at the health system. It's not based on keeping people healthy. And therefore, I'm going to say thank you for that information, but I'm going to choose not to intervene. Can you explain what a P&L lead is? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, from the profit and loss, their income statement, that, um, sorry, Carla, yeah, that individual was being evaluated on um, the revenue that was being brought in on a per patient basis and not at the profitability or keeping people healthy but rather how many clicks under the fee-for-service that individual could receive. Is that good? Okay, good. So on a yearly basis, if we took just a standard individual, right, and everything stays the same, they have the same amount of scripts, they have the same amount of specialist visits, everything else happens, and we avoided one of those ER visits, right? And we've created $1,000 worth of value in this individual. Now, the question is, where does that $1,000 go? And that's the next three hours worth of conversation. But we've now created cost savings or value within the system. Now, did we get it, did we create net <laughs> value? If you look at it on pure, we're going from 13.7 to 12.7. We've actually only created a couple hundred dollars in value in, against in pure year over year terms but we're against the 6.5 year over year trend that's happening there. So we've created value against the trend, which is pretty fascinating. Now, let's talk about where we're talking about those multi-chronic individuals um, that were referenced before. If we have, we, the, there's one way to create value, right? We can create value on an absolute basis, which we've done by missing an ER visit. We can create value by beating trend and just holding steady. But the other aspect of, we can also create value by looking at <laughs> um, changing the denominator as opposed to changing the numerator. And this is the most classic thing that I hear from providers across the board. Um, my patients are not as healthy. I have the sickest patients in the history, in the entire system. Every single primary care doc thinks they have the sickest patients. And I've been at places all across the country. In Indianapolis, the only guy that I actually, um, actually had the sickest patients, he had the highest prevalence in diabetes in a medically underserved um, area. And his patients would come in. He was an African-American doc, and there was just a tremendous amount of trust in him. And they would wait for hours to see this doctor. Well, where would he send them to wait for him? There was a steak and shake in the parking lot. 
And the doc said, while you're waiting for me to have your diabetes um, exam and talk about managing your condition, I don't have a coffee shop or a Starbucks, but go sit in the steak and shake and grab yourself a meal while you wait for me. Surprisingly, the guy had an even higher prevalence of uncontrolled diabetes um, for his patients. So anyway, um, but if I look at that risk adjustment bucket, that's how do I account for a population or an individual that is multi-chronic and unhealthy, and how can I show that that individual is, needs more care over a period of time? And that's where we get into this risk adjustment example. Now, on a year in and year out basis, people will present, and we were talking about capturing information, capturing diagnosis, and treating that, but ultimately you have to understand the population before you start to treat it. So it's, it's pretty fascinating. If we had a 84 year old male who presented to a primary care doc, who's a diabetic with a 40 BMI, uh, age uh, smoked until 65 and a history of depression and anxiety, what Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services does is provides, tries to baseline this person and they weight all the conditions and multiply at times the expected medical spend. So as a provider, if I capture nothing at all about this individual, just say I saw a 84 year old male, that 84 year old male is only expected to um, spend about $5,100 a year on med spend, which as we know about from what we were talking about before, that's below the average. Um, that doesn't make any sense at all, but we're choosing not to report to CMS, um, not capturing everything. And, and if you talk about government inefficiency, um, it's pretty fascinating. If you do not capture the diagnosis or the condition of an individual for either the government or health plans on a year over year basis, the government or the health plans assume that that condition has cured itself. Said differently, in 2021, if I have a below the knee amputation because I was a diabetic, and I come back in 2022 and my doctor fails to notate again that I had a below the knee amputation, CMS, United Health Group, et cetera, will assume that my leg grew back. Um, so outside of Spider-Man 1 with Tobey Maguire and the guy with the lizard who grew everything back, you're not, that's probably not gonna happen in today's society. Now, if you capture everything on the secondary, uh, on the one on the right, where it's a type two diabetes, obesity of 40 plus BMI, depression and anxiety, I've now bumped this individual for the expected med spend up into the $11,000. And you know, it's not apples to apples, I apologize for um, not having everything tick and tie. But I'm looking at how am I beating that 15.7 because I added an extra three grand or two grand because of the risk adjustment and how can I do better? So now getting it back into how this type of program and other innovations and other technology and everything else, what are the things that can assist someone in this area? Well, capturing codes is, is, the, is a starting spot, but treating the disease, identification, and spitting people out for what's going on um, within, the, within the healthcare system. I look at this purely as from a primary care perspective, but that primary care doc then can choose where those individuals are going to go and how they're gonna spend their money there. And uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty fascinating world in value-based care. Right now, um, uh, you can, uh, the government has an ACO REACH program, which in addition to doing this, there are factors for living in underinsured or underserved communities. There are places where community health services come into play and drive up this number as well. But it's, uh, it's a brave new world and uh, the opportunity to make a difference on the margins and in specific interventions is absolutely amazing. Two o'clock exactly, Carla. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so this is a whole other way of thinking about things, isn't it? Compared to what many of you 
have have dealt with, um, and it's and whether it is from the point of view of the system, C or CMS, health, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, or from a, a private health insurer, it's not about the relationship. It's not about the relationship between the physician and the um, and the patient. It's about that the population and practices and systems. And um, just to give you a, a, an, an interesting, uh, uh, I don't know, angle on this, Clarence Shannon, who is a, a, one, of the, one of the deans in the, in the medical school with a specific focus on innovation, um, his real focus is on healthcare delivery. It's not necessarily on devices per se or pharma, or anything. It's about that, that total system. And, um, and, and so when you guys are thinking about your own projects or your own ideas, it's the question of how are you bending those curves? How are you contributing to bending that curve in, in different ways? Um, so, you know, Judy, you're focusing in on a potential diagnostic as an example, okay? Is that, are you guys doing di diagnostics as well? I can't. I'm, pharmaceutical. pharmaceutical. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask, and I've forgotten your name, but I remember Sarah's name. I'm going to ask you guys to share what you're thinking, and then apply it to what Andrew was just saying. Okay. <laughs> um, so should we should we say like what we do? Is that you want us to say like what our drug yeah. is? Okay, yeah, um, so we work on an anti-hypertensive um, medication, and I guess what I'm thinking in terms of what you just talked about would be what our drug would cost the healthcare provider and how that might relate to how it, it, it is being, like hypertension, how it's being coded in terms of value-based care. So is that increase in med spend going to cover the cost that our drug would be compared to the other antihypertensives on the market? So, so wonderful. Yeah, you're thinking about it perfectly because so often you get in these discussions with providers, right, and it's all about identification or, or did I treat that specific condition during that visit? And so, you know, you look at all the, the risk strats and the, and the value-based, uh, the coding aspects, yeah, all these. And I would sit there and talk to providers and they'd say, well, I didn't talk about um, the, the person being obese. So therefore, I didn't code it. Or I didn't talk about their hypertension, but I talked about their diabetes or vice versa. There's a, there's a third code that goes in here, which is multi-chronic interaction between hypertension and diabetes. So I've gotta make it easy for that primary care doc to figure out what the heck is going on and cue that up, and there's technology and, and a lot of fun stuff on that. But then your ultimate aspect is, did I bend the curve with my drug, and what did it do? I mean, it's, it's fascinating The you, know, you talk to a cardiologist and you say, what's the best way for someone to recover from a heart attack? It's like put an ICU in the back of their house and have a cardiologist on, on duty 100% of the time, they never get go to a doctor or anything else. And that's kind of the same way. It's like, what's the best way to um, recover from hypertension or treat hypertension? It's like, know what the hell's going on. And uh, so diagnosis is so huge on that. Yeah. No, and, and is the drug effective and <laughs> did it go through clinical trials and everything else? <laughs> that's a whole different story. Great, thank you. So I've been kind of, picking out people that I personally know, but there are other people in the room. Are there, is there anybody that wants to share from their own experience how what Andrew was talking about, or their own, whatever their own efforts are, how Andrew was, has been talking about in terms of value-based care might have applied to your, uh, to whatever you're working on? Okay. And, <laughs> And I'm sure if you've you know been involved in any of these organizations on campus is is recognizing that we are you we're affiliated with one of the strongest healthcare systems here and and talking to physicians, understanding the care path, understanding that the touch points that your intended patient is going to have is going to be key. So already, you know, what you just described of how is hypertension diagnosed. What's the cost savings if they were provided? How you know how can you save 
an ER visit? How do you save, um, you know, if you can save four visits over the course of two years? And it, so understanding how they look at that, I think it's gonna be critical. So please reach out, find your network. I'm certain there are physician groups associated with um, the U that are, are, are there to answer your questions. And for the time being, you don't have to go to Sioux Falls yet to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the check hasn't been yet. Yeah, hold, hold on just a second. Let me come back here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's not a question per se, but um, it's more not of an observation. And I'm still in the exploratory phase of my innovation. I was part of the medical device innovation program at the University of Minnesota, and I also had a chance to do the evaluation lab at the Carlson School of Management. I was part of the fellowship too, so I've been involved in a lot of projects in uh, medical device innovation, and I work for a medical device company. But during some of the projects, uh, one of the things I learned is how dentists tend to upsell I've been to a dentist and I've been part of that. And uh, looking at North Minneapolis, um, there are probably no dentists at the moment. There, there, there used to be a lot of dentists there, but I think the last one or the last few closed a few years ago. And I know the state of Minnesota is one of the first states that uh, um, licensed dental therapists uh, in order to try and bring down the cost. Now, with all that, uh, one of the things I'm particularly interested about in in um, in in the medical field, especially in healthcare in the United States, is how to bridge that disparity or inequity. Uh, I mean, what is your thinking about that? Because in some of our researches, when we were doing our uh, uh, practicum, we did find cases where um, even with some of the therapies like TAVA, uh, those um, uh, minimally invasive therapies where minorities were particularly, um, there was a disparity as far as being given these therapies. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in how we can uh, bridge this gap or what's is your thinking being in that primary based field? Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful question, and and uh, the Accountable Care Organization um, ACO Reach program is attempting to do that with the federal government, and whether it be dental, medical, et cetera, if there's there are uh, add-ons in terms of the RAF score, the risk adjustment factor, for situations like that. So the more that things can be monetized <clears throat> against the denominator with a risk adjustment score the better that out healthcare outcome is going to look for the um, individual buyer um, from, from my perspective. So it's, it's one thing to demonstrate a need and demonstrate efficacy. It's another thing to drive value against the denominator. So I think it's, I, I think just taking North Minneapolis by definition has a weighted factor on that. And so on and so forth. So it's a it's pretty, but I would that's where I would start. Um, quite honestly, is is it a medically underserved area? How does it in, play with the ACO reach? And then North Memorial, um, here in the Twin Cities, I think is part of that. Is has an ACO reach, or there are other primary care docs that do. We just have an online question too. Okay. Can you comment on whether telemedicine may help reduce the cost? Yeah, that's a. A, a very insightful question. So Village, when the uh, Village MD, when the um, pandemic started, we converted to 96% telemedicine visits, and we were able to continue to treat patients under this value-based world. Um, but net net, uh, anything that's telemedicine is going to be a huge boon in intervention. That being said, <laughs> there is still a level of trust in getting dressed and going to the doctor and looking at um, what goes on with uh, that intervention and having that, um, having that uh, trusting relationship with your primary care doc. Um, 
one of the most fascinating things that we did as we started to design our primary care offices is we made them multi-generational primary care offices and we insisted that you s we could see everybody from ages 2 to 102. And uh, so, so often you see a grandma taking doing child care for a grandchild while mom or dad's at work and grandma will forsake the visit of a 10, 12, or forsake their own health for the visit of a 10 or 12 year old. Um, so in the situation of telehealth, telemedicine, that sounds really great um, on its face, but what happens if you've got multi-generation visits and somebody going into the health system or going to a doctor's office who wants to be treated um, at the same time as their, their grandchild? Um, so that, that's one thing. One of the things we did, which was kind of fascinating to address that, we did reverse telemedicine, where if you presented at a clinic um, from a primary care visit and there was no uh, uh, availability at that point in time, we room you in a exam room with an MA and then dial in a doc who's offsite and is able to see that person. So that's an ER visit avoided. You're in the, with a medical assistant, you get all your vitals taken, everything's recorded within the system and uh, you're able to kind of uh, uh, adjust for your volume. 